Gary, um, this is a very impressive um, headquarters. I mean, this it's first not thing. even the headquarters. Oh, it's not the headquarters. No, this is the uh, second office in New York. Headquarters is real fancy. Oh, tell us where. Tell us. That's in Hudson Yards on the west side in New York. Okay. This is our studio here. We have obviously oh, wow. some office because we're growing so fast. We've run uh -huh. out of room. But th this office has about 100, headquarters has about 450. Oh wow. So it gets really crazy. I didn't realize yeah. that. Yeah. So tell us um, what an average day looks like in your life. Tell us from morning, what, what's yeah. an average day of Gary's life? Uh, I wake up at six, I work out till seven. Mm -hmm. I, I shower, spend 10, 15 minutes with my kids uh, before they go to school and then I go to my first meeting at eight or 8.30. Okay. Um, Usually breakfast somewhere outside the office. Usually I'll get to the office by nine. Um, and then from nine a.m., so basically meetings from eight a.m. outside the office to nine, nine in the office till usually six or seven, just every minute booked, no lunch, no one minute to spare, no downtime. Meeting after meeting after meeting. I mean, you see what's even happening with this, right? I've been here for We're, two hours. Yeah, you know, like it's every second is booked. Um, and then at seven, uh, I'll go and do meetings from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. at night. Uh, that is the typical day. 30% of the time I'm traveling, mm -hmm. going to clients, you know. Uh, only 10% of my life is probably Gary V. Yeah. When I speak or do appearances or do something like this. 90% mm -hmm. uh, of it is me being the chief executive officer of VaynerX, which is the holding company that owns VaynerMedia and PureWow, the women's publishing site. Um, and so. That's how I navigate, you know, just meeting, operating, 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 meeting, 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 operating, operating. Interesting, and so what are the, let's talk about business. What are the qualities that you think make for a true and a successful entrepreneur? What's important? Uh, she or he has to love the game. For me, a purebred entrepreneur, she or he loves the journey, mm -hmm. not the stuff. You know, one of the things I struggle with in the current state of entrepreneurship is a lot of people want the vacations, the watches, you know, even, even the context of this, you guys have such incredible imagery. I think it's remarkable. Who doesn't want fine things in life? Yeah. But I think that if you're in the game just for the fine things in life, for the bottles and the models and the private planes, I think you're gonna lose. And it definitely is not my definition of an entrepreneur. My definition of an entrepreneur is somebody who can't live without doing their thing and trying to create, literally suffocated. When I was young though, I, I, I learned, because I've been an entrepreneur my whole life, you work hard, you get a deal, you reward yourself by yourself a watch. What, what's your thoughts on that philosophy? I think that worked for your DNA, mm -hmm. and I respect that. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think you get to judge what somebody does with the fruits of their labor. Yeah. Uh, for me, I think that that's what's amazing about anything, which is there's many different, uh, many different uh, definitions. For you, uh, you know, go out, work your face off, win, and reward yourself with something is exactly right. For me, the reward is pouring more of the dollars and energy into the company, not buying stuff for myself. It's one and the same. Yeah. It's one and the same. I don't, I don't judge. You know. I talk a lot about like, stop posting cash and Lamborghinis and private jets. Not because I don't think one deserves it after they work hard, it's that so many of the people on Instagram that are posting that are fronting. 100%. I mean, they're like literally driving to a private plane pad, taking the photo and then driving home. They're, they're full of shit. Mm -hmm. And so, to me, I, I think it's amazing if somebody wants to buy an Armani suit or a $5,000 pair of a belt or a diamond ring for 100,000. I don't, but that doesn't mean that's right or wrong. Mm -hmm. What I'm doing with that same 100,000 instead of a ring is I'm hiring two more people because I'm trying to buy the jewelry company, not a piece of the jewelry. I like that. <laughs> that no, that's a great quote. And um, your fans and followers really turn to you for motivation and inspiration. Where do you draw your inspiration and motivation from? Who, who, who motivates you? Obviously everyone, there's different levels them. of motivation. It's really interesting, I've been thinking about this a lot. Them, it's crazy. When somebody DMs me, when, when you're like, she's a fan, it's crazy what that feels like. It's fuck, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. My motivation isn't like Elon Musk or Bill Gates or Warren Buffett. It is only two things, my parents and then the community itself. 
But you, when you say it, it's really true. I mean, you really are for the people. I mean, you love your, you love, you know, you love the game and what you're doing. I really do, man. And what's funny is like, I'm not, I love talking about it because I know there's not going to be another shoe that drops. Like, I'm not going to turn dark. Mm-hmm. You know, like, you know what I think people struggle with? They don't, uh, they forget or don't know that I knew how to build businesses and made money before I became somebody people knew. So like it's, you know, it's very easy for me to give to my community because I'm not looking for anything from them. Exactly. That's the other question is to the outside, it seems as though you've had a lot of success at a young age. Talk to us, how do you define success for yourself? Tell us a little about I have a really good answer for this one. This one I've known for a long time. To me, the ultimate success is doing what you want to do every day and having nobody have any impact on that. Interesting, and when, and at what age did you start having that? Uh, probably, you know, I had a very, I had, a, I had it as a kid, because I had a very successful baseball card business when I was 13, 14, 15. So I tasted it early, which is probably why I got addicted to it. Yeah. When I went into my dad's business, the truth is my dad gave me a ton of autonomy, and that's why I was able to build him a big business. But I didn't have full control, because it was still my dad's business, right? Mm-hmm. Though he gave me unlimited reign. Uh, when I started VaynerMedia, I probably felt it for the first time uh, because my brother was my partner, but I really was kind of like the A. But even that, I had to have empathy for him. Uh, it's probably why I like my personal brand because mm-hmm. it's the place where I have 100% control. Yeah. Uh, so that's cool. Uh, so I would say somewhere in my mid to late 30s I started feeling it, maybe 37, maybe only five years ago. Uh, and I think actually that's probably why so much good has happened in these last five years because I, I, I feel like, you know, super free. My next question is, it seems that you have the magic touch when it comes to investing early in companies that have been successful. Uber, Twitter, Venmo. What do you look for in early stages of a business to determine whether or not you would actually invest your personal money, time? Two things. One, uh, do I believe in the thesis? When I invested in Venmo in 2009, I thought people would text message each other to settle payments. You know, and back then, people were like, what? Because everyone was about PayPal, so you... Yeah, and PayPal wasn't doing texting. No. You yeah. know, yeah, to your point. So like, it was like you had to project. I thought everybody would have social media accounts. Mm-hmm. That's not what people thought in 2007. Mm-hmm. So I have to believe in what you're saying. And then number two, I have to believe in him or her, the jockey. It's all about the jockey for me. Where I've lost money is I was right about the thesis, Black Jet. Black Jet is a company I invested in, right? Yeah. Which is basically Jet Smarter. Yeah. Same thesis, I was right. But it didn't become Jet Smarter because the jockey didn't win. So you were on the wrong side of the jockey. That's right. Uh, uh, you know, I was chasing uh, Yobongo. Yo, Bongo, I was right about the thesis. The thesis was Tinder. I had seen the app Grinder, which in the gay male community was people hooking up. Yeah. And I was like, that's definitely gonna happen with guys and girls, right? Mm-hmm. So every app in 2010, 11, 12, that kind of looked like it, like people meet each other when they're in close proximities. I was betting. Okay. But mine didn't become Tinder. So I was right about the thesis, but wrong about the jockey. Got it? Yep. Hundred percent. When a lot of people, uh, when a lot of people describe you and what you do, presumably based on your social media, um, they describe you as a motivational speaker, which yeah. you are. But you're also an entrepreneur and a yes. successful business person. Yes. How did that part of your persona and career come about? You talked a little about it, but talk to us about that. Because I mean, obviously, you're I wrote a, a successful I got businessman. It. I wrote a book called Crush It. It was awfully motivational in its nuances. I just, I, you know, I didn't realize it, to be frank. I, I've always been a hype man and excited with my friends and my employees in, in life. I started being asked to speak, uh, and the first time I went on stage, it was there. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay. And then, in 2010, 11, it really became a thing. Like, I was speaking a lot, people were saying that, and I didn't want to be it. And so in 2012 to 14, I didn't do a lot of internet content. I wasn't that out there. And, uh, and I was really focused on the business and not looking to build that brand. And then in 15, I realized that I don't think I'm a motivational speaker. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I think I'm an entrepreneur who happens to be motivational. However, 
in the last two years, I realized the reason I'm really going all in is, to me, it's just strategy. It's mental strategy. Like, it's just smart to be optimistic and to be grateful and to, like, the things that people deem to me as uh, motivational, I think it's that I'm emotionally intelligent. Great. What are um, some of the challenges you faced, or you talked a little about some of the mistakes you made on your investments yep. that you made in your professional career that you believe you've learned and have become much better at? I was really bad at firing. I was too empathetic. I'm, a, I'm really empathetic. It's my superpower and it's my weakness. Mm-hmm. And so at a macro, it's my superpower, but at a micro, it's my weakness. It w- I would sit on firing somebody for a year or two okay. because I just didn't want to fire them. I felt bad. Uh, so I think that that made me a little bit less uh, authentic, to be frank. I feel like I would sandbag people. Like, it's cool, it's cool, it's cool, and then just fire them. I'd be upset with them. I'm like, how didn't you see you sucked at everything? But in my 30s, I'm glad I went through that at Wine Library because at VaynerMedia I've been much better, but even in the last three years I've been better than the first five years of VaynerMedia. I need more radical candor. Yeah. Uh, and so being an empath, you are thinking about the other person. You know, I always used to say to my, uh, some of my girlfriends and friends and mom and white, like I, was, I was like, if I was a, a woman, I would have loved the bad boy because I would have loved to try to like help, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so I think I was, I think that I didn't, I think I sat on decisions too long that were detrimental to the business out of empathy and what I did was I empowered the second and third and fourth tier players at the expense of the first tier players and I think I've gotten a lot better at that in the last year or two. I would think with the way you run your business you would expect that to all your employees. You mean accountability? Just, you know, from like, I mean, you're, you're mm. precise to the point, six, you know, six to seven, go to the gym, yeah. be with my kids, you know, eight no. a day. No, to your point, no. I hold myself dramatically more accountable than I hold others. Mm. And I think that's cool and that's what a great leader is, but I don't think I had all the dials perfect. Yeah. I think I'm very optimistic to me being an operator from 50 to 60. I think I'm gonna be really in a great place with my crescendo of like being empathetic but also being uh, strategic about who's getting compensated and how. So I remember last year you launched your K-Swiss collaboration, the Gary B 001 and 002. Yes. I was surprised at how quickly it sold out. I mean, I'm a sneakerhead. And yes. I mean, a lot of people were like, who's gonna buy the, you know, the yeah. K-Swiss? It's not like you took Adidas or Nike. Yeah. Talk to us about the deal, and I mean, obviously K-Swiss is a great brand, but it's not I an easy it. brand to sell I get out. it. I mean, you K- set yourself up with a little bit of risk. I did, but all upside. 100%. And so, I, that's why I did it. It was a nostalgic brand. I'm 42, so K-Swiss was fly of in the course. 80s in the hood, so I knew there was some swag there. Uh, I, I thought my audience would resonate, um, and so to the credit of the president of, uh, of K-Swiss, Barney, he sought me out, we had breakfast, I liked the vibe, I could see it wasn't an influencer deal, this was a real collab. Mm-hmm. Um, we kept working on it, we went there, And I was very confident that I could sell the the sneakers, and we did. Uh, And now they're making a hell of a lot more for the 003 and the 004 that are gonna come out later this year. Uh, And I'm excited about it. It's been huge for me in culture. You know, sneakers, as you know, are one of the five, seven, 12 kind of pillars of culture, Mm -hmm. right now at least. And uh, being in that game and surprising the market was an awfully, uh, awfully powerful thing. That to me is because you are a sneakerhead, so it would have been easier to do a Nike collaboration or Adidas because obviously it would have been a lot easier to sell. Yeah, but I don't think my brand and I was at a level where they would have sought me out. So it was a real win for me because one, if I did one with Adidas uh, or Nike, first of all, they would have gotten the credit, not me. Mm -hmm. I think with the K-Swiss situation, we both get credit, right? I get a lot of credit for moving it. K-Swiss gets credit for being smart to, to seek me out. And how did you apply your knowledge into the design of those shoes? To be honest with you, the first one was very lightweight. Like I wanted to be green because of the Jets. Yeah. Uh, I wanted them to be things I would wear. You mean the New York Jets? Yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, and I wanted to be you know have a little bit you know it has my signature and it has a you know some my words and the soul. So it I was uh, the 003 and the 004. I'm even more involved in. I wanted to be empathetic. 
to the designers in K-Swiss. I'm not imposing too much. I wanted to learn and watch them, but I still wanted to have my fingerprint on it. Now I have my handprint on this one, and eventually it'll be my hand. I mean, it's sold out, and now I remember, because I follow you, you were showing how it was reselling for more. Yeah. So, I mean, in street credibility, the yeah. sneakerheads, I mean, how excited was that? You know, like, huge. I mean, I, I mean, believe. I couldn't believe, I mean, literally, I was sitting there, I'm like, my God, the 18-year-old version of me would have been the guy that was buying these. Yeah. And now I, ha it, 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 like, the only thing I could say is I never was destined to be on a sports trading card. Yeah. But, like, it was literally the next best thing. So entrepreneur, I mean, I know we talked about how you respect your followers, but on an entrepreneur and business people, who are some of the people you look up to, you admire? You know, I don't look up to anybody. Mm -hmm. That's just the truth. I admire everybody who's doing it honestly. I mean that. If you're making $100,000 a year, $63,000, a buck ninety-seven, two million and you're doing it the right way, yeah. I admire anybody who's doing that because entrepreneurship is hard and lonely. Right? Mm -hmm. It just is. And so admiration through the, I mean through the, I mean I admire the people at the lowest levels, the pe people that are just, aka just starting, like have a job and have the ambition to come home at 7 p.m. And get to grinding, like take that photo, try to get the light right. Darn, it's dark out because I worked all day and I got to pay my mortgage or my debt. But I'm still gonna build this. I'm gonna be an influencer. I'm gonna start this T-shirt brand. I'm gonna I'm gonna sell these caps. I'm gonna get brands to pay me for sponsorship on my basketball meme page. I have enormous admiration for anybody that's trying to do it. Because you have to understand one thing that people get twisted. The second you say you're about to do something and build a company, you're out of being an employee and being a student. When you're an employee and a student, you can blame somebody. Babin can blame, if the videos don't pop, he can blame me. Mm -hmm. He didn't give us the resources, he didn't give me the right camera, he changed the words. You can blame somebody. I can't blame anybody. Yeah. If this isn't successful, it's your fault. Correct, 100%. Like, you could say, well, she wasn't, mm -mm, you hired her. Mm -hmm. Like, everything that's bad here, my fault. All yeah. of it. That I admire anybody who's willing to go there. Because that takes a level of scrutiny that most people don't want to deal with. In your business, um, the media side, yes. most of your competitors are out pitching and looking for customers. Yes. One of your customers was telling me a story how they, for six to nine months, were just trying to reach out to you. <laughs> um, it's actually Paragon Auto. Yes. And they were talking about how they were just, like, they were emailing <laughs> you, they were DMing you, and they couldn't get a hold of you, and then they called a friend that knew a friend that knew a friend. I mean, and then obviously they, I, I think they hired you because they said yep. that and you obviously are probably charging yep. them a high fee. But as a businessman, I mean, how excited does that make you feel in your business? Because usually in your business on media, they're on the opposite, they're hounding the, the clients for the business when clients are chasing you for, the, for your services. It's always fun to be the girl that everybody wants to take to the dance.